Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to take a look at a whole bunch of different uh, RPG zines that I've been sent over the last month or two. Uh, I get sent these all the time and usually they're too small really to make a whole video out of. So I just grabbed a whole handful of them and we're going to take a look and see what we get in here. Uh, some of them might be more old school D&D, some of them might not be. We'll find out. Uh, before we start, this video is brought to you by the Labyrinth Adventure Game. So this is a game that I helped write. I wrote the adventure in this book, which is most of the book. Uh, it won any awards uh, last year for best family game and best cartography. So if you wanna explore the world of Labyrinth, you can head down to the description below. I'll put a link there. All right, let's see what we get here. First book is Desert Moon of Karth. I think this was part of a zine quest Kickstarter from a little while back. It says it is for use with the Mothership Sci-Fi Horror RPG, and it is done by Joel Hines. You have an I search the body table on the back. It's all staple bound or um, saddle stitched, as I think the term. Really nice quality. It feels really nice. It has that that texture on the cover where it feels almost soft or fuzzy. I don't, I don't know exactly what they do to get it to feel that way, but it feels really nice. Um, let's see what we see inside here. We have a map of Karth with a quote from this guy who wrote The Little Prince, which looks like it's pretty applicable here. So this is a tiny little moon, breathable atmosphere, gravity is basically earth gravity, but the circumference is only 250 miles or so. So this is a really small moon that must be very dense because it has earth gravity. So a, lot, a little bit like the tiny little planets from The Little Prince series. Looking at the cover, I get the feeling this is gonna be a Wild West-ish, uh, type of adventure or a setting. It says it's been inspired by things like Dune, Firefly, John Carter of Mars, The Dark Tower, Cowboy Bebop, Spaghetti Westerns, and Sandbox Adventures like Hot Springs Island, Ultraviolet Grasslands, A Pound of Flesh, and Slumbering, slumbering Ursine Dunes. I've actually reviewed all of those books in the past. I'm going to check them out on my channel. So it's a tiny little moon. There's relic orbital satellites that are shooting down ships that come near. It's on the edge of known space. It's a bunch of different factions there. And there's fossilized chunks of aliens that people are digging up to use. We've got a timeline here. And we have a bunch of different factions. I like how each of these factions has um, arrows going from one to the other. So you can see how they feel about each other. So we definitely have uh, faction play going on here where a smart party could uh, exploit it by turning one faction against another or ally with a particular faction if they have things that they need. We have some aliens here. There's only nine of them left. Uh, the Valley Rangers, which is a cargo cult formed around the Lunar Park Service's tattered bureaucracy and traditions. We have a group of skilled colonial marines and the Dawn Seekers, who are immortal 500-year-old whites maintained by harvesting organs. They sound delightful. Everyone has different desires and fears, which is really good, because that way you can know how to run them. We got a timeline, what happens if the players do nothing. Some reasons why you're here, some rumors around town, and coral dust addiction, um, which I think it looks like it makes you immortal if you take enough of it. So it's a bit like the spice from Dune. Traveling around the point crawl. I like how this point crawl has these maps here, and I think the number is the time it takes to go from one to the other. So it's really easy to tell uh, how long the different journeys take. And it even wraps around from one side to the other, which makes sense because it is a tiny little planet. We've got some random encounters. Uh, at night, roll twice and choose the scariest encounter. Use the basic mothership system here for doing those random encounters. Uh, they can either be omens, so these encounters can be far away and you're seeing signs of them or a direct encounter. I really like how there's one or the other and it has information for both of them. So for example, you might find some Valley Rangers on a journey or figures in the distance with glints of crystal. Arrival, so Karth is like a little station on this planet. Nice little drawing of it in 3D, which is nice because you can tell the you know, vertical height of everything because you're probably gonna be crawling around roofs and sneaking around. All the different places are described here. I like how it's right on the other page. Some stuff like the governor's manor, um, the governor's dome palatial home retrofitted from majestic crumbling white ruins. A fountain softly arcs inside the misted vine uh, garden courtyard. 
has a large tank containing an important bioluminescent luminescent shark. Cool. Random counters for day and night. NPC generator, lots of them here. So you roll on a D100 table, you get a name like uh, Penelope, a description, maybe they are a gambler. And what do they want? Perhaps, uh, have you seen this gal? Or what I'd give for a core sample deep under the sand. So you can get lots of little adventure hooks really quickly. Major NPCs, they all have pictures, they have desires, they have fears, and they have jobs that they're gonna give you. Excellent. So this looks very alive and very entangled. Um, all the characters are, have drives that are gonna push them to do particular things. And I think we start getting into some of the locations that we can explore uh, on our map, like the Shattered Visage, this big um, stone statue head that you can crawl around inside. The Seahorse Mine. Gotta have mines if it's a type of Western, along with a little dungeon crawl here. You have things like air scrubbers, a generator room, winding tunnels. Anything that's interesting or pointed out has a exclamation point, which is really nice. These are really, they're really bold. They really pop out. You can see them right away. Bridge over ravine, a rickety broke rope bridge crosses a shallow five meter deep flat bottom ravine. Across there is a faint sound of several voices whispering deliberately. Faint bioluminescent glow emanates from a hole in the wall near the ravine's bottom. This looks very easy to run. Uh, it gives you lots of information, but it's kept short and tight, so you get just the stuff that you need to run it. The Silver Spire. Lots of kind of dungeons uh, throughout this, whether they're you know, large buildings or they're actually underground, lots of places to explore, but they're all mostly done on two-page spreads, which is really nice. Some more NPCs of the Spire, got desires, fears, and jobs, including some secret jobs. Let's see, who is this? This is Rena, focused on her work, genetically modifying donors to serve as better organ hosts through brutal experimentation, speaks directly and in a monotone. Her fears are dying before learning everything. The Wigoi seed mines release. I think that's the aliens that are fossilized. I think there's a few of them left. She's uh, getting their parts. And she fears other Dawn Seekers treasury. She has jobs, but then like there's a little line down here that connects to a random table. So that's a nice little flow chart design there. You can meet the aliens themselves and they can give you gifts to mutate you in different ways. So perhaps your mouth distends forming a toothed maw like a sand squid. Your voice is heavily distorted. A ship graveyard, some worn space hulks that are smashed there. At the center, you have the Catharizer Oasis, a privateer crew that looks like they want to get off. Mothership is typically a horror sci-fi RPG. This really doesn't have as much in the way of horror vibes, which is totally fine. Um, I really do like the vibe because I like things like Firefly and Cowboy Bebop, and this looks like it's really leaning into it. Re Rejuvenation Center. Orion Bounty Hunter Generated. Oh, this is nice. Reminds me a little bit of um, some of the stuff we saw in, there's this generator for cyberpunk campaigns, augmented reality, that has tons of tables like this. I really like this stuff. So Bounty Hunter, let's roll one up here. His appearance is pink mohawk, sleeveless shirt, nose ring, always wears shades, preferred methods and equipment, bola launcher and snares destructed quarry, also booby traps. Calling card is, communicates with sign language and never removes their helmet. Their quarry is um, a debtor. Client is a experimental scientist. So someone's in debt to the scientist. Um, what about their quarry? A highly contagious bioplague carrier. Oh, right, so that's probably why the scientist wants them. Maybe they've been infected with an experiment from them. Special requirements, proof of death required. Don't ever let them talk to you. Maybe he knows something about the scientist that would perhaps turn you to his side if you knew it. So just by rolling on these, you get a nice, uh, cool little mission. Where are they running? They're running to a bustling population, Silver Spire. So you know where they're going, you can hunt them down across the moon. Some rules for dueling, because it does have that cowboy vibe, so you're gonna be doing shootouts in the streets possibly. And sand squid, which are a lot like the giant sandworms from Dune. So some fun callbacks. Oh yeah, and you can get swallowed by them. Crawl around inside, maybe shoot your way out some artifacts and some 
NPCs and monsters you can run into, the bleached one, spine coral, sidewinder sail, and D100 old tech artifact artifacts. Let's pick one at random here. The black handbag, apparently made of undulating snakeskin, contains a walk-in closet-sized extra-dimensional cavity, currently filled with sandy si synth silk scarves. Opens wide enough for a person's entry. So you're gonna hide inside your own handbag. And some search the body tables. It looks really good. It's uh, very well made. The art is really nice. Um, layout is great. And there's lots of stuff to adventure in here. It gives you tons of material to just travel around this tiny little moon. So this could be a really nice expedition if you're in a mothership campaign and you're just ex escaping some sort of thing that's hunting you. Go to the edge of the galaxy, land on this moon, and have a Wild West adventure. Fun times. Let's see what else we got here. Next up, we have Rune Cairn. Interesting. That reminds me of, um, I think there was another book, Cairn, that was a hack of Knave, which is a game I wrote. I think I looked at that previously. I wonder if this is related to that. It's a Norse fantasy role-playing game inspired by Cairn, Knave, and Into the Odd. Well, there you go. Explore a new world rich with forgotten secrets, lost magic, and dangerous mysteries. Slay fearsome creatures, delve into crumbling ruins, and navigate an untamed wilderness. Designed to be played with one player and one warden. The gods have fallen. Fresh life blooms from the ruin. Fate is yours to weave. Death is not the end. It's by Odin's Beard RPG. And by Colin Lesseur. We have some principles at the beginning. That's nice. You get a good sense of what you're in for. Principles for the warden. I guess that's like the GM. The warden is also what you call the GM in Mothership, which is interesting. Give players lots of information. Make sure you prepare things. The game world should be organic. Narrative focus. Uh, danger produces real risk and pain. So the game world is dangerous. You've got to think about what you're doing. Give players lots of choices. Principles for the players, agency, attributes and related saves do not define your character, they are tools. Don't ask only what your character would do, ask what you would do too. So get immersed into the setting and think about it as if it was real. Explore, plan, have ambition, that's really nice. It's great to have players that are proactive and take steps to further their own goals and don't just like wait around for you to drop the next plot hook for them. It's always great to have players that are proactive. Some principles of the worlds. The realms are full of danger and wonder. There's echoes of the old world everywhere. So the nine realms, this is very Nordic inspired. The Aesir and Vanir are all dead or missing. Mjolnir is lost. The Jotun, Jotun are scattered. Most fled to Jotunheim. The bonfire will always lead you to safety. So that sounds a lot like Dark Souls. Bonfires link the, link the nine realms. Magic is wild and predictable. Interesting. Death is not the end, so probably you can maybe revive. Character creation, you get 3d6. This looks a little bit like Into the Odd, where you have strength, dex, and wits, but it also has spirit here, used for charm, self-control, intimidate, persuade, belief, etc. So vigor is a d6. That's like your hit points, if this is like Into the Odd. And you roll a d6 to determine your vitality, or how hale and hardy you are. So there's two different stats. Interesting. Resilience is the amount of vitality and vigor. Add the two stats together to get your res resilience. Hmm, I wonder why there's two of them. Some starting classes here. Uh, warrior and Scald, so they have some special abilities here. Some extra slots. So this is slot-based, it looks like, which makes it uh, a little bit like uh, Knave, which is my slot-based fantasy RPG. Start off with an axe and some special abilities. Scalds, you might think that those are a bit like bards, but I see things like lightning knife, you have a shout, cure wounds, lightning spear. So you're sort of like a servant of Thor, perhaps. You got a scout, probably focusing on dexterity. You can dash, you can backstab. And seers of things like a barrier, which is a reaction, cast a barrier spell, slow people down. So that's more like a straight up wizard. Example of character creation. I really like to see that because it just makes things easier if you can see a character sheet and you can walk through what you're doing. Uh, a lot of the game mechanics come into focus pretty quickly when you do that. Some basic concepts here. You're rolling D20 underneath one of your um, attributes, just like an Into the Odd, in order to succeed at things. 
You have defense, which can um, reduce damage, it looks like. And then once your, your hit points or your hit point um, equivalent is worn down, you can start taking strength damage. And then if you take strength damage, you're gonna have to make a strength save to um, probably not pass out. That's how it works in Into the Odd anyway. You have 10 inventory slots. Yeah. You have a few, some bonus ones depending on your class, it looks like. Fatigue, so I've seen this in a number of different Knave hacks where um, if your character gets tired, what you do is you mark off slots in your inventory as fatigue slots. And then you have to drop things that are in those slots. Basically, basically you're getting um, more tired so you can't carry as much stuff. I think that's a really elegant solution. Uh, death, prepare to die often. Upon death, you wake up the last bonfire rested and with all your current items. Yeah, so it's like Dark Souls. I've never played Dark Souls, but I have watched people play it. So I have the general idea. And there's souls as well. Wow, it's really... A lot like Dark Souls. So you can uh, kill guys, take their souls. If you die, you gotta go. Um, you, know, you have to actually go back and pick up their souls or else you lose them forever. And you can spend souls to increase abilities. Okay. Items and equipment, you got armor and shields, weapons, your standard stuff. Damages from a D6 to maybe a D10. I like how the different weapons have different special abilities you might be able to pull off with them. So that gives them a bit more differentiation. Combat, I assume it's gonna be pretty similar to Into the Odd. You can react to an enemy attack and attempt to either block, deflect, or avoid. So it's a bit more detailed. There's a bit more tactics in terms of um, what you can do in combat. Whereas Into the Odd is pretty much, you just roll dice to deal damage. I think this works the same way, where you're just rolling dice, you're dealing damage, it goes right off of their hit points. So there's no like armor saves, armor just reduces damage. But you can make reactions to try and stop things, it looks like. Omens, omens are messages from spirits, the gods or the land and can represent fortune or favor. An attack reduces your PC's resilience to exactly zero. This triggers an omen. Interesting. So maybe this is like a death and dismemberment table. Let's see what one says. You hear the howl of an, of an enormous wolf rolling across the landscape, followed by echoing calls in response. Make a deck save. If you pass, the wolves can't find you. Oh, so it's just other narrative twists, I suppose. An example of combat. How magic works. So magic has rune stones and sagas. Uh, rune stones and sagas contain a single spell and take up one slot. Okay, so again, that's a little bit like Nave. Each spell takes up a slot, it's like a physical thing. Uh, they cannot be transcribed or created. Instead, they are recovered from places like tombs, dungeons, and ruins. Scrolls are similar to rune stones and sagas, but they don't take up inventory slots. They don't cause fatigue. They disappear after one use. Okay, so maybe spells use fatigue. Yeah, after every spell, add a fatigue inventory, occupying one slot. So if you're casting a lot of spells, you're gonna get really exhausted. You have to start dropping stuff. Okay. Some spell lists here. Things like gravity shift. Yeah, so like some of these are from Nave. Some of them are, it looks like they're new and more Norse themed. Like things like, um, what's one that looks new? Sathir Volley, propel a flurry of magical arrows, striking all creatures in a 10 foot area for D6 blast damage. There's more damage spells. In Nave, there really isn't any damage spells, but it looks like they've been added back in here. Scald spells, and some monsters. Elves, Draugr, Dwarves, Jotun, Rock Troll, your typical Norse monsters. Looks like most of the, or all of the art, or hard to say, probably most of the art, looks like public domain, but it's pretty well chosen. Got a lot of classic illustrations right here. Very interesting. Icelandic pronunciation guide. That's probably gonna be important. I saw some of those um, spell names use things like the, the thorn. All right, interesting. Rune Cairn. What else we got here? Uh, next up is a packet of particular peaks. This is done by LFOSR. I believe put out a physical version of Nave a little while ago. Thanks for visiting the peaks. Planning a visit to the peaks? This packet is all you need. A packet of particular peaks is a go-to reference for a system neutral, old school inspired fantasy setting that provides a drop in, drop out experience. Run a small side quest within the peaks, start a parallel campaign to your normal adventures, 
or simply pull content from this packet for your role-playing sessions. Uh, it's quite dense feeling. Cover is very, th very thick. It's almost like, it's very uh, rigid. Um, paper quality is quite nice, but it's almost too dense. Like the book really does not want to stay open because it's just very rigid. Um, you might want to think about paper that is not quite that rigid. Uh, something's a bit softer because it's a little hard to hold open here. So it has three different peaks. Let's say Passage Peak, Dream Peak, Bleak Peak. There's a bestiary and some magic items and roll tables at the back. Uh, interesting art style. Kind of reminds me of like um, woodcuts, like prints. Got three different peaks. You can enter the peaks through mental means, like being knocked out, concussed, or experiencing physical physical trauma. So there may be this like a dreamlands situation. There's ways to get there. You can have mental visitors and physical visitors. So there's ways to get there physically as well. Passage Peak. How to enter mental enter mental entry. One can mentally enter a passage peak after succumbing to what the given traveler would describe as their happy place, entering a Zen state, mentally checking out, relieve, reliving a pleasant memory, and so on. Physical entry can be stuff like creating a unique wood carving or stone chiseled rune while allowing oneself to succumb to drifting thoughts of passage peak. Hmm. I wonder if you get entire parties to go there. Because if this is a different location and just one player goes there, you're going to have a whole side quest with just one player, which could be a little annoying. You'd probably want the whole party to go there. Some different features of the overland of Passage Peak, like sky pillars, thin columns of rock and earth that seem to extend infinitely into the, into the clouds and sky above. Some random events there, like different types of monster attacks, a surreal shift, extremely strong winds, some different inhabitants, like the Velo, inf infamous in some circles and famous in others, Velo is a well-known human that resides in a tower nestled in the long-forgotten trails. He studies realities and is often conducting dimensional experiments. Some locations of interest. And there's a hex map for it. All right, so this goes back to the locations before. Um, let's see. Might be better if the, this map was before the locations, right? Because we read all locations and then we find out where they are. It'd be nice to have that picture first. Interesting. Um, what else we got here? Dream peak, just like forgetting a dream. Physical entry, see, mental entry. Um, during a deep dream sequence, they might accidentally slip into the peak unbeknownst to them. All right, physical entry. The traveler must sleep alongside a crystal ball, which will slowly shatter and materialize the peak in the sleeper's dream. So this one is more like the dreamlands. Some overland features, star drops, impact craters from one of the many falling stars crashed into dream peak surface in which a coveted mineral is formed. So I suppose there's a lot of very modular information here. It looks like you could grab a lot of this stuff and drop it right into any normal mountain range that you happen to be running. If you just had a lot of a very mountainous terrain that you were traveling across, you probably steal most of this. Some random events like a deep mist or the source sore star spotting. The source star has been spotted in the area, granting one miracle to one of the witnesses. This wish always comes at an unforeseen cost. Some inhabitants. And then again, it was same sort of deal here. Locations of interest, like the silent river, the flowing forest. The clouds of clarity, and then the hex map for it. The art style is very distinct. That is nice about it. It does kind of set it apart from a lot of the other maps I've seen. Bleak Peak, the climb of your life. I think the mountains are getting a little bit more dire as we go on here. Uh, mental entry can only be visited mentally by an unwilling individual that is experiencing a moment of hardship, either physical or mental. It must be near a breaking point. Physical entry... One must shed all material possessions and allow themselves to perish by natural causes, such as coming to extreme cold or heat. So this is like the afterlife. Some sort of struggle you have to go through. 
Malice jaws, that's pretty terrifying. Sentient snapping jaws filled with jagged stone teeth spewing tongues and ancient curses. Leak trees, tallow pits. Some random events like miaz miaz miasmic, miasmic clouds. Clouds of large clouds of fine blackened dust that rest within the lungs of inhaled, causing a slow descent into madness. Some inhabitants like the High of Urkay, Psychotic Knights, the Fell Cult, the Edge of the Dust Fields, the Stairs of Solomind, Midfell, the Shrine of Self Reflection. And we got a nice creepy hex map here. So there's eight locations for each of these mountains into a bestiary here. So there's tags for each of them. It tells you where they are, what their threat level is, and then some other stuff like this says it's a being of light seen in passage peak, medium level threat. That does make it easier to identify. This is all system neutral. There's no stats at all. So you're going to have to steal the different um, ideas here and then put your own stats in depending on what game that you're playing. Although telling you if it's low, mid or high level threat, um, would be pretty easy to ballpark for D and D. You could just map that onto hit dice. Like low level will be like one through three hit dice. Medium is like four through seven. High is like you know eight and to ten, and like extreme would be higher than that. Chris Elk, they'll eat. There is quite a lot of apostrophes in this. This reminds me a lot of '90s fantasy. Apostrophes everywhere. The Froze Men. Millworm, Memoir, Moundart, Rumination, and the Sharrow. Hmm. And some magic properties and items. This is quite hard to hold open with unless you're using both hands at the same time. Uh, lots of different magic items. A dark handled sword with a void blade discombobulates targets. So lots of good magic items that are very concrete. They don't necessarily mess with your stats. They just give you interesting powers to deal with. Some roll tables, an adventure generator, and there you go. That's it for a packet of particular peaks. All right, next up, we have Blood Floats in Space. So this is a very short little pamphlet. Um, again, compatible with the Mothership sci-fi horror RPG. Trinket's table on the back with stuff like miniature ivory harpoon, trench knife, a quarantine flag. Uh, this is written by Chance Phillips, who's done a lot of other zines that I've reviewed before here on the channel. Uh, some rumor tables. And who else is involved here? Writing by Mabel Harper, Fiona Geist doing random tables. Uh, interior art by Jim Magnuson and Scrap Princess and Steve and Stefan Poag, who's done Dungeon Crawl Classics art. So that's cool. So this is a new setting for Mothership that details the empire without borders or competition. I kind of like that name, actually. It's nice and verbose. A massive, slowly splintering confederation ruled by the Sovereign, a ruthless dictator who has shed her physical form in favor of existing as a mind fully detached from material distractions. Two new Mothership classes are available for characters hailing from the empire. The Juggernaut and the Psychic. The Juggernaut is an abomination, a flawed melding of flesh and steel, and the Psychic is a product of brilliant mind being opened up to incredible otherworldly powers. I really like that there's a summary here. What are some rumors here on this table? Um, this local dog is just the worst. Or a local drunk bought a Xeno pistol, but it was just a scrap metal lashed together. Or perhaps a stranger is offering to build a grand bell tower in the Empress's honor. Uh, that's probably the Sovereign right there, who's turned herself into a giant brain. Some new classes. We've got Juggernauts. There's our starting saves. This is all the Mothership system. You have bonus to strength in combat. Once per session, the Juggernaut can roll an armor save instead of a fear or sanity save. Got some military training. Lots of different kinds of armor, like made of countless infinitesimally thin metal sheets or joints are somehow obscured, making the entire armor appears to be one piece. Your weapon might be razor sharp spikes uh, jut out from the knuckles, as scalpel, or electrified metal contacts all along the armor's exterior. Miscellaneous stuff, uh, gold accents outline various um, seditious phrases and iconography. Maybe this is a little bit like uh, evil space marines. Pressurized taking damage results in white hot gas bursting out. Fun stuff. Uh, we got psychics here. 
minus five strength. When psychics fail a sanity save, they must roll again under their intellect or also roll on the psychic catastrophe table. So uh, things go bad when they go insane. I'm getting a little bit of uh, some Warhammer vibes here with like psychers and space marines and like a crazy omniscient emperor. Um, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of Xenos. Uh, Faith of the Empire. Got some scrap princess art here. So the different gods, Mindor, the Archer of Time, the, Jade, the Jail Arrow, Queen of End. Fa'al is a continuous explosion, expelling shockwaves and excrement of dying suns across the universe. Manifestations could be stuff like Dr. Oppenheimer uh, or the Wolverine, a small but extremely vicious badger-like alien life form who comes from outer space and voraciously eats and kills about anything it comes across. Its cells are capable of regenerating at an alarming rate and is nigh unkillable. So it's literally Wolverine. The God in the Well, it's very Lovecraftian. And he got like what their actual religion is. So these worshipers who undertake an obscure religious tradition merely called the path meditate on their extreme emotions in an attempt to drive power from their own volatility. Interesting. Nabrak is the God of life, the first tumor and Genesis. He's a pulsing cancerous heart at the center of the universe, always growing, always mutating. So yeah, definitely getting chaos gods. This is very Nurgle-like. Some new equipment, biospray, colossi, chain swords, divine engines, and psychic powers. Powers are things like demonstrate your mind has dominion over base matter. Or for every psychic that dies due to their own folly, another dies in a psychic duel. You have, uh, these are very verbose names. I kind of like it. How quickly can every atom in your enemies quake apart, quake before they fall apart? Or often it could be advantageous to look like an army. So in this one, for example, the user reflects themselves into near perfect images. The only difference in the copies is that they resemble, resemble the user's self image, not necessarily their true appearance. They have difficulty ratings. So some are going to be harder to cast than others. I assume that if you fail the cast, then bad things are going to happen. Yep, so I get catastrophes like tears of blood, sudden polydactylism, panic attack, hypoxia, organ failure, the huge. And we got some more, more rumors on the back here. So I guess you would use these as plot hooks. Something tainted a whole shipment of vapes being sent to Imperial aid regiments. The effects are distressing. Heretical works in an abandoned library are being transferred into the great glittering jeweled library. Or at Doom's Gate, champions vie to become the master of the pits. That's it. Blood floats in space. All right, what do we got next? We have uh, a visitor's guide to the rainy city by Beauregard Hardebard. I get the feeling that is not the actual name of the person who wrote this. Uh, master and four wardens of the fraternity of the art of mystery. Let's say that again. Master and four wardens of the fraternity of the art or mystery of haberdashery and millinery. Let's see what we got here. I got the feeling this is a setting. It is staple bound, which is nice. So it opens up quite wide. Ooh, that's a nice map. Let's see what we got there. I think in the packet this came with, there was also a much bigger version of this map. Um, but I believe that was just for Kickstarter. So I think everyone else will have to s settle for this little map here. But it's a very nice map. We've got different regions. Headlands, Embassy Row, Tower Cliffs, the Mids, the Merc, Vagabond Bay, Rickety in the Swells, Old Town, Levy Town, and the Sump. So this looks like islands. Probably kind of a Venice feel to it. The Rainy City. Interesting art. And it's very woodcutty. Is it public domain art? I don't think it is. What does it say here? Um, cover design cartography. Interior art by Bill Sim uh, Spitma. So no, it is not public domain. That's a really interesting take on RPG art. I like it. Written and created by Rich Forrest. It's the end of the world. It always rains. Rain beats against the walls. It seeps through the shutters. It pours off the mossy locks of the gar mossy backs of the gargoyles. It turns streets into rivers and streams. 
teetering damp towers lean against rotting townhouses thrown together in the ruins of a once gleaming city. Servants dash through storms on petty errands. Fireplaces sputter weakly, and spellbooks filled with moldy spells rot in spite of the protections lavished on them for their precious contents. So it's a rainy city. Got a Grand Academy of Magic. There's wizards here. From the author, I am Warden Beauregard Hardebart. <laughs> That's a really funny name. I'm just, I was just guessing, I don't know. Um, so it's all written in character or in world. That's really fun. So I suppose this is, is there any stats in this thing? No, not really. Doesn't look like it. So there's probably a system neutral um, setting that you can explore. Uh, looks vaguely fantasy-ish. Probably plop it down in most fantasy settings. Just kind of put it on some islands off the coast. It's wet all the time. And if they explore there, you can have this as an actual pamphlet in the world. I love stuff like that. I think I did a video a little while back just covering um, these types of books that are all in-world artifacts that your characters could pick up. I love collecting those. They're so much fun because they have a personality all of their own. And it gives uh, you something to give the players and they can just use that to explore, right? In between sessions, you can give it to the, that one uh, player who just likes to read stuff. And if they want to read it, then they can pick up information about the background and the factions. And then they can come back to the next session with all sorts of ideas. I think that's the idea here. Some people, stuff like Deep Sea, victim of the, de the Depsis, a malaise which makes its sufferers progressively fishier over time. Very Lovecraftian. Some gargoyles. Larva, fat white worms, legless, armless, the size of overlarge children, human faces. They led an evil life, and this is their punishment. Or gulls, chirping, wailing, opportunistic. All gulls of the reigning city are gulls. Intelligent, three foot tall, and with wings that can fly or hold tools, but not both at the same time. It's bad luck for a sailor to harm a gull, and every gull knows it. Uh, we got seasons here. Uh, the quiet is the season of growth, molds, and mildew, sowing and reaping. The tar mines are bubbling over. The silver cliffs produce more ore, along with so actual festivals. That's really cool. So Bell Ringer's Day, Firelight, Molten Hand Festival. I love that stuff. Um, it doesn't have particular like days of a calendar. I guess you could make that up yourself. Uh, but it's really fun to have in campaigns an actual calendar with feast days on it, so that as time goes by, the city changes and recognizes the passing of time. And these, this would allow you to shake up different days of the year with a lot of new events. So firelight is a season of warmth, bonfires, and grilling, smithing and coining. Fire is burned normally. Food can be roasted and grilled instead of prepared with boiling salts. That's interesting. MO, smith, craft, and fire-based work must be done. The rains continue unabated, but there is more warmth in the city, more wealth-changing hands, and a great deal more smoking of every possible herb, leaf, and weed. The rainy season... Season of downpours, sea folk and fish, refugees and rejuvenation. Fires, whether magical or mundane, will not light at all. All food must be prepared with boiling salts. At this time of year, the natives of the sea be they krill or, called, crid, krill or cod, uh, octorfus or mermaid, can breathe the air above as easily as the waters below. Mermaids on palanquins go shopping on the mid's promenade. Oh, that's great stuff. The windy season, midwinter night. Life in the rainy city, uh, how does light work? Because you're not going to have fires most of the time if it's raining constantly. Um, you will see a lantern fish in a bowl affixed to the wall. Heat, many of our lights are not so a warning, it is true, but our city is rarely truly cold. It is chill often and clammy, but not insufferably so. In firelight, we soak up as much fire heat as we can, because there are certain seasons where you can have fires and certain seasons where you can't. Uh, food works, drink, pests, rare delicacies, wild beasts, speech, hats. I don't have to tell you that the most important accessory in the city is a good hat. Umbrellas are of value, but we all know that the drill union of brawly factors rather overstates the merits. A hat will not become entangled unless you are so close that you want it to be. So we, this is, I think, one of the locations or one of the regions, Rickety and the Swells. It's a floating pirate haven. So that wasn't on the map. I remember there was an arrow pointing off. So that's going to be a little bit off the coast. So the, this has what weather is like there, what law and order is like, most unwelcome. It's a pirate haven. Disorder and disarray, always. 
and some locations that are marked on here. The cabin, the iron worm, junk town, like junk town is over there. Rope Street, the yard, the high docks of, Rick of Rickety, where ships come to be hoisted aloft for repair under the steady hands of carpenters and shipwrights. More stuff on Rickety and the swells. Mysteries that you can find there. The Bobber Sea and End Swell. Things to do. Join a pirate crew. Explore Phantom Isles. Vagabond Bay. Your port of arrival, with its piers and docks, ships and warehouses, sailors, bullies, and refugees, barnacle-encrusted shacks, narrow alleys, ramshackle causeways and piers, rotting wood, and the salt spray of brine everywhere. The writing is really good in this. It's very evocative. It has lots of specific details that are unusual and make the place seem unique. Uh, and you get a real sense of what it's like to be there. It's great stuff. Um, getting to hand this out to a player would be a lot of fun. Vagabond Bay, what are some organizations? You've got the Admiralty, the Noble Association of Fishers and Fishmongers, the Port Association for the Bene Benef Beneficial Incorporation of Refugees and Asylum Seekers, or the Chivalrous Order of the Cuttle. Things to do. You've been wronged. You are a smuggler. Join the porters. Old Town is one of the major regions, looks like here. Law and Order is the Old Town Law is guild law. Trenchant guild enforcers and merchant bodyguards impo impose order over their domains. Different types of guilds, like the Harmonious Chantry, the Master and Four Wardens of the Fellowship of the Art or Mystery of Haberdashery and Millinery. We've heard of them before. The Molten Hands, the Society of Thatch, the Pudding Hands Union, or in their own words, for hundreds of years, we, the goodly members of the Pudding Hands Union, have kept both the stately homes and understately hovels of the rainy city clear of the myriad oozes, slimes, molds, jellies, goos, muck, sludges, and sundry amorphous blobs endemic to our metropolis. We, the people of the pudding, toil in the damp and dark so you can go to your toilet without losing your seat. And yes, you are very welcome for it. But we do not do it for your gratitude. We do it because we take pride in the work. Things to do, prove the pudding, walk the Thatcher Road. I have a map here. The Merc is the fog-bound canal that separates the upper and lower islands of the city. The different locations to find there. Organizations are the, the Adepts of the Deluge, the Beneficent Order of the Sponge. It's a guild of common working people who, with sponge and mop, engage in ceaseless labor to unwet the streets. Everyone knows that in Levy Town has the driest streets in the city thanks to the proud work of the sponge. You may wonder how anyone can tell the difference, but we know the streets are drier because the order of the sponge tells us so. All that labor must amount to something, otherwise why would they do it? The order of the pump, the order of the wheel, and the revelations of the drowned man. Things to do, break curfew, volunteer, start a cult, Working people of the city unite. The sump. With locations like the Pig Witch of Muddle Marsh, the Whisper Wood, the Worms Well. Great names. Things to do. Enter the, sh uh, the Shine Trade. Mr. Snobpick Barley Smith has a vision. The Grand Sump Pleasure Gardens. The Mids with clubs like the Imperial Society of Explorers, the Honorable Association of Liars, the Rainy Day Club, the Smokers Club, the Spit Farthing Club, the Sprouting Club of Old Stair Bay, or the Surly Club, is devoted to avid disagreeableness. Embassy Row is where the city's best live. You can be certain they are the best because they have the most money. Strange and fanciful mansions in the styles of a thousand worlds, whisper-topped watch boxes lining the streets, filled with watchful boxers. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. I love that. That's so good. Uh, the track, the cricket field, high society. Welcome to the home of the vulgar rich. As a vagabond, I'm sure you'll be getting in there robbing their houses. The headlands, the city's northern plateau of clift coasts, high moors and fells with deep woods. The tower cliffs, where wizards make their homes. The veil between the imminent world and the invisible world is thin here, waxing and waning according to its own in inexplicable laws. A place of manses, seclusia, and towers, of the unreal made real, and of phantasms and illusions. 
some different wizards to find there. Dominion the Proscriptor, Mavin the High Critic, Oculem the Oracular, Orbeg the Multipotent, Sisko the Improbable, Vramir the Unseen. You gotta have, love a city full of, you know, eccentric wizards in their wizard towers, causing trouble. And some patrons at the back here, I guess you could send uh, you out on missions. Like, who do we got here? Snodpick Barleysmith, Esquire. Levy Town Solicitor with a Vision. The Grand Sump Pleasure Gardens. You help him procure and pacify the site. He will help you with your little legal problems. Or perhaps the worm. The bottom of a well in the sump lives the worm. It does not come to you. You come to it. It can grant you what you ask. But now, you must do something for the worm. And the Sandestin. There's always been a Sandestin in Rainy City, and there always will be. You, vitu you, you, vituper uh, you vituperative snot bag. Loquacious Germain, the 18th Sandestin, a right cur and hunter of beasts. The impossible has occurred. Three of them stepped forward to claim the title. Scandal and skullduggery. Which of, uh, is the true? Will there be others? What does this mean for the city? The era of the no one Sandestin has arrived. Uh, I've had this book on my shelf for a long time, and it's been way too long. I should have read this earlier. This is really fun. Uh, just the world building is great. It's short, it's punchy, it's useful, and it's funny. I think players would really dig it. Uh, a couple other things I saw on my shelf. These are just some more Mothership stuff. Looks like little pamphlets. Um, short adventures from Mothership, like this one is The Haunting of Ypsilon 14. So I think Mothership has been putting out these short adventures in pamphlet form. Uh, I assume because they're just you know very quick to make, they're very uh, cheap to send out to people. It's a great little format. They're basically one-page dungeons. So yeah, this looks like a dungeon in its uh, flowchart format, which is which we've seen before in Mothership stuff, like in Gradient Descent. So this must be the Ypsilon 4 asteroid. Workspace, mine depths, it's a mine of some sort. And there's a monster. An invisible alien being that was sleeping in a pod within the meteorite, held in stasis in, a, in an on an interstellar voyage before the mining disturbed it. It can devour you. Mouth uses powerful suction and circular rows of sharp teeth to devour its prey. Once devoured, players must take a body save every round or take a critical hit. Devourer leaves no trace, consuming any and all organic material, the victim appearing to vanish chunk by chunk as it enters the monster's invisible digestive tract. Cool. Explore the uh, asteroid and try not to get eaten. Oh, nice. There's actual like cassettes you can pick up with audio logs, which is very video gamey. That's fun. Uh, what do we got here? Hideo's World. So this is Maverick inventor Hideo K. Ha ha ha. Designed the Hypno DD, a prototype games console that could be played while sleeping. Running slickware in place of the user's dreams. With the tech too expensive to mass manufacture, Hideo attempted to turn a profit on the project by selling ad space within a specifically made slick world and broadcasting his own dreams via satellite as entertainment. When this failed to make an impact and the satellite broadcasting system was shut down, Hideo resi resigned to a life of drug induced coma, living in the game world he had created alone. And I'm sure you're going to go in and uh, mess around with it. It's all written in Comic Sans, which I'm sure is an intentional choice on <laughs> who did the work for it. Layout by Sean McCoy. Sean, um, let's see, we got a plaza. It all looks like a video game. That's fun. There's little coins, coin glitches. You can mess around with the code. Communications tower, there's bugs. Little dungeon here as you climb up this tower. Glitches that you can activate within this dream world. Uh, like you can erase stuff, you can texture swap things, you can spawn things, you can gift things. Object repeats in its last next motion indefinitely. And there's ads that pop up. The deep blue bathhouse, an oasis for body and spirit. Project Dolphin, every star within your reach. And uh, the last little pamphlet here is the Mothership uh, Hacker's Handbook. So I think this is a, um, little rule supplement if you're going to be getting uh, more into hacking if i remember right in mothership there's just like a hacking skill and that is a d100 system so you're probably just going to be rolling under your d100 uh, number to try and uh, hack things but uh, this i looked through this a little bit before it has a system where you can build a uh, 
computer network or figure out what the network looks like behind the scenes to make hacking a little bit more of a puzzle. Um, and you can involve people who aren't hackers a little bit more because there's ways where you can access different terminals if you have the right credentials. So it can make sense for them to sneak into the building and you know attack people or steal things, get everyone involved. So the hackers aren't just doing things on their own. So you have like a little network designed right here where you can have these different, you can network here and network here is connected this way. You have different terminals, like a terminal is a place you can actually access in the real world. And then you can see where it can connect you to. Um, some places have response values. So as, the, as you access more and more places, the response value goes up so that when an alarm is triggered, you can roll over here, adding the amount of response that you've accrued and it can, things will get worse and worse basically. So you want to be really, really careful. Uh, the different nodes that you can hack into have different information and they have different levels of security. So some might be totally open. Some might need to be hacked. Some might be really hard to hack and some might be full up encrypted and you need the actual password or the encryption key. And you're going to need to find that probably in the real world, or maybe you can hack into a different node where that key is being stored. So it's a little bit like a dungeon crawl, but just happening in, you know, hacking world in cyberspace. It's a nice little system, and I think it'd be a lot of fun for players that are doing a lot of heists and infiltrations. And how to do different accounts. So different user accounts, depending on the, uh, the job that that NPC has, will allow you to access one node and not another. And you can build a lot of um, little problems to solve there. Equipment. A lot of fun cyberpunk stuff. Brick Boy. It's a portable dongle which fries hardware on triggering on a triggering event, like a door being opened, a PDA receives a message, etc. A Faraday bag, small bag that blocks contents from all signals, and so on. All right, yeah, so that's all of the little booklets and pamphlets that I have today. Um, probably in a month or two, I might grab another handful just to see what else we have in there. Um, as usual, links to all of these are gonna be down in the description below. Most of them are available in PDF and print form, um, at least in PDF form for sure. So uh, check those out if these seem interesting to you. All right, thanks for watching everybody. See you guys next time.